Hello, this is Andrew Al from Digital Charlotte, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast. Today, we'll be listening to the Di- National Digital Inclusion Alliances, also known as the NDIA's Net Inclusion Webinar Series. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Conference has been a staple in the digital inclusion community for years, bringing hundreds of practitioners, advocates, academics, internet service providers, and policymakers together to share their knowledge. With social distancing in place, the NDIA is hosting the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series to replace the conference. This series includes eight one-hour webinars recorded live from September 16th through November 4th. You can find the full schedule, recordings, and resources at digitalinclusion.org slash net inclusion 2020 webinar series. The link to this will be in the description. Today's webinar topic is coalitions, who's at the table, who is convening, and how are strategic decisions made. First recorded on October 28th, 2020. Enjoy. Welcome. This is our seventh in our series of eight the Net Inclusion webinar series. Uh, it, this is our replacement to our in-person conference. We should have been in Portland. I know Matt's gonna start crying. <laughs> I will try not to cry. Uh, I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, the previous six webinars are all on the website, uh, free and open for anyone to use. We welcome you to those. We're gonna give folks uh, just another minute to log in and then we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone to the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series. These are our sponsors. Uh, I realized I've done a very poor job of thanking them. They they originally were sponsors for an in-person conference and generously allowed us to switch their sponsorship to an online event. So big thank you to all of these sponsors. And this is our seventh in the series of eight. Our last one is next Wednesday. Yes, I am relieved. These are a lot of work in case anyone's curious. Uh, so a uh, big thank you to our guests that we have with us today. We're gonna talk about coalitions. Uh, I'm a um, big fan of coalitions. I think their impact can be really huge and we've seen the impact be really incredible. And uh, these five fabulous people are gonna tell us about the work that they've been doing in their coalitions. So. Um, just so everyone knows the way this works is that we keep it rolling pretty quick with our um, with our conversation with our fabulous panelists and the question the Q&A section of Zoom is where we encourage you to put your questions uh, and then of course engage in the chat. Uh, we do of course want folks to talk to each other not just to us. Uh, this is an hour long webinar. We will get all the meat of the content in in an hour if um, we have asked all the panelists to stick around past that hour in case you do have a few more questions that we can make sure we get to everybody's questions. Uh, so if we need to stick around, everybody's already agreed to do that, which is 
very generous of them because they all are super busy people. Alrighty, uh, so I'm just going to go around and have folks uh, introduce themselves because um, it's just faster that way. <laughs> and nobody wants me to read anything to them. Uh, Carrie Coogan, tell us about you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carrie Coogan uh, with the Kansas City Public Library. I'm also the president of the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here this afternoon and participating in Net Inclusion. I, along with Angela and everyone, are so sad that we can't be there for the event, hopefully we can have it soon. And I just recommend for anybody who's new to the call or new to this space, you should definitely put it on your list of, of conferences to go to. I've never met such a group of engaging people and learned so much from so many people. So I highly recommend it once it's safe. <laughs> we should also note also that Carrie's on the board of directors. So I, again, am having yeah. a call with one of my bosses. This I would say, I would, I would say that anyway, though, just so everybody knows, <laughs> full disclosure. Um, and so uh, in my role as deputy director of the library, I work in digital inclusion a lot, all of our digital literacy programs, educational programs um, I'm responsible for. And then I also get the honor of um, heading up the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion, which began, um, as many of you know, back in 2012 when Google Fiber first came to Kansas City and we wanted to capitalize on what that would mean uh, for the city. And we realized that there was, we realized very quickly there was a digital divide. And so, uh, the group started meeting uh, fairly informally once a month at the library and to talk about ways that we could help support those in our community who didn't have access, um, didn't understand what the access meant, didn't have devices. And then we opened up the um, coalition really to anybody. So we accept providers, we accept city leaders, we accept organizations, neighborhood groups, you name it. And that's what's comprised our coalition to this day. Super. Thank you, Carrie. Matt Timberlake. Hi, I'm Matt Timberlake with Multnomah County Library and Multnomah County. Um, so I actually work for Multnomah County. I manage a portfolio of uh, technology projects for Multnomah County Library. Um, and, in, and that's in Portland, Oregon. And I can't tell you how sad we are that we couldn't have all of you at uh, Net Inclusion 2020 in person in Portland. So uh, we're hoping for next year. Um, and uh, I have to, let me just second what Carrie said about it just being a fantastic conference. I've been to every net inclusion and they are far and away my favorite conference. The, the people, all of you who attend, uh, it's just wonderful. Um, so uh, I'm a founding member of the Digital Inclusion Network here in Multnomah County and in Portland, um, which was formed in 2014. Um, and uh, we are in the process of re thinking our digital inclusion network and our digital equity action plan and who's at the table. So I'm particularly glad to be invited to this, to this seminar, this webinar. And to Super. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Renee Gonzalez. Hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm Renee Gonzalez and I'm the chief strategy officer with Lit Communities. And I'm also the chair of the Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio. Um, and I'm actually the chair of the steering committee uh, that is represented about 15 members through, um, from within the community. Um, and our general membership has about 30 organizations and over 60 members. And uh, we have been in existence since 2017 and are actively seeking transition into a, a formal uh, nonprofit here um, as we get towards the tail end of the year. And um, I share the same sentiments as my colleagues on this panel here. Uh, I was invited to join uh, Net Inclusion 2019 up in Charlotte and I met my tribe and I felt so at home. I never felt so connected with a greater group of, of, of leaders and advocates and um, just true innovators and thinkers and doers. So um, I'm very thankful for you all joining us today. And I hope that our conversation regarding um, <clears throat> how these coalitions are built and these kind of deep dives that we have to get into the trenches to kind of get some of these solutions out the door. So I hope it's um, very impactful for all of you all. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you, Renee. Mia Gregerson. Hi. Um, well, thanks. First of all, thank you so much for including me in this panel. Um, I'm surrounded by such an amazing group of people. Um, but uh, I represent a state representative for the 33rd Legislative District in Washington State, so just north of where Matt is. And um, I got introduced to this work when Sabrina Roach, who I'm sure many of you know, she lives just uh, in a city across 
across the way here, and we were putting our heads together around what a digital equity act could look like for Washington state. And that was last year. And so naturally you can imagine um, when COVID hit, uh, we got back together and I'm excited to talk a little bit more about the coalition building that we've been doing. Um, it's a little bit more informal probably than some of you here, but it's a, an exciting space to be in and, and I'm looking forward to telling some of those stories. Perfect, thank you, Mia. Chrissy Powell. Awesome, thank you, um, Angela, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Super exciting, this is actually my first Net Inclusion Conference. Um, I was hoping I'd be able to go somewhere besides Maryland, but um, maybe next year, <laughs> fingers crossed next year. So um, I'm Chrissy Powell. I and the, the leader of Bite Back Baltimore on the Baltimore site. So um, uh, Bite Back, of course, we are a tech inclusion nonprofit that focuses on um, adult learners and taking them from basic digital literacy and computer foundation skills through um, certifications in tech and into jobs. Um, so I came on board with Bite Back in 2019 last year year to expand Bite Back to its first city outside of the DC area, which is Baltimore, uh, which is home in so many ways. And there's a great, great need and a, a huge divide um, as we'll go into later in Baltimore, of course, throughout the nation, but um, Baltimore specifically um, to me. And, you know, back in March of 2020, myself and um, three of my colleagues in the digital equity space, also leaders of um, equity organizations, um, we just started a conversation and said, you know, how's it going? How can we support each other? And he said, you know what, let's invite our other colleagues and let's have a meeting. We'll have a Zoom meet and see how we can collaborate and support um, going in like this new norm, if you will, and supporting our participants and clients. So um, somehow it grew legs and it grew into the Baltimore Digital Equity Coalition, which um, is about over 60 organizations um, now, uh, nonprofits, mostly workforce development, adult education, K through 12, Enoch Pratt Free Library, uh, universities and colleges, as well as city officials and funders um, all participate in our coalition. So um, what was initially a rapid response effort has grown into a long-term initiative. Um, so I'm happy to be here, thank you. That's awesome, Chrissy. So that's what we wanna talk about, right? This huge variety of the programs that sometimes the coalitions are short-term meeting a need, and other times it has been around for a long time in the, and then the idea that those short terms would, would turn into something longer. Matt, let's start with Portland. Uh, you all have been around a long time. Talk about how it came about and the connection to the city's digital equity plan. Yeah, so we um, formed in 2014. Um, several of us had been to the first uh, Gigabit Summit in Kansas City. And we um, had a meeting at uh, Portland State University with uh, Multnomah County Library and Multnomah County and uh, a few other members who were in there, our community who were engaged in actively in digital inclusion work like Free Geek, our local after um, provider of, uh, of refurbished equipment. And from that, we decided to form a digital inclusion network. And I think one of the things that we did well um, was that we didn't ask ourselves when we were thinking about how to form a digital inclusion network, who is working, we didn't say who is working on digital equity and inclusion. We said, who is serving, what organizations are serving the people who are digitally excluded? And that made a big difference. So we cast a very wide net in our community um, and we've, had an initial summit in November of 2014, and we invited a, a very large group. We, we had government officials, we had libraries, we had schools, we had community-based organizations, um, but we also had healthcare providers, workforce development, uh, home assistance. Um, uh, we, had, we invited the ISPs, Comcast, CenturyLink, Verizon, T-Mobile. <laughs> And from that summit, uh, we invited elected officials who came and gave speeches about the importance of digital equity and inclusion. And, and from that, we agreed as an as a outcome of that, that we would create a digital equity action plan. Our goal was 
to create a very actionable strategic plan that had milestones that required us to report out. We didn't want a strategic plan that sort of sat on the shelf. Uh, of course, in 2014, lots of organizations didn't know what digital inclusion was, even if, even if they were helping solve it. And uh, so we started out by hiring some consultants, local consultants who did focus groups uh, uh, with locally digitally excluded populations, some of them very focused, uh, Black community, the Latinx, Vietnamese, Mandarin, the, those last three in their own languages. We had, and we invited people in who we knew were digitally excluded. We used our CBOs to, to help identify uh, participants. And uh, we took that information and that informed three workshops, half day workshops in which we brought all these organizations together to create a, an action plan. And um, one of the big benefits of that was that because so many organizations helped write the plan, they were very invested in it, in its success. They, they, they took on um, uh, jobs in the plan. They, they accepted milestones that they had to work on. Um, and so out of that came our digital equity action plan in 2015, which became um, uh, a kind of a model. We, we presented it at Net Inclusion. We won the 2016 NATOA Broadband Strategic Plan of the Year Award. We were all very excited. Mary Beth Henry championed it uh, very effectively. And it's been, uh, we've reported out on that plan every year since. And uh, it was a, it was a, um, a plan that, um, we are currently in the process of revisiting. We're trying to write a, a deep 2.0. And in that process, we're also looking at uh, rethinking our, who's at the table and, and what a digital inclusion network should do. And especially in these times of COVID, what opportunities and challenges there are. Super, thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Carrie, I think um, Kansas City is the next oldest coalition amongst these five, not like, ever, but, but here with us today. Uh, and a um, fun fact, Kansas City's coalition was getting started about the same time NDIA was getting started because we were all tangled up together. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and Kansas City is where NDIA uh, held our first uh, conference. So Carrie, talk to us about um, the formation of the coalition in Kansas City. And then I wanna talk a little bit about how it's changing just as Matt noted, they are looking at changes also. And I know you all have already gone through some changes. Yeah, well, and thanks Angela. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that, you know, Kansas City also has um, a digital equity strategic plan that was ushered through um, by our assistant city manager, Rick Usher, who is also on the steering council of our coalition. So I think it's important um, early on for those of you that um, have a group that meets like a coalition or doesn't call itself a coalition, getting city leaders involved quickly, I think can help um, begin to make sure they understand. I, I say that now that you know we're in this crisis, so many of them already know it's been a crash course, but I think that really helps to get city involvement at all levels um, as quickly as you can. Um, and so I guess, Angela, the question for us is, you know, we, you're right, we've been around a long time. We've been working on a lot of different um, initiatives, you know, trying to bring more people into the fold. The, the biggest thing I think um, that the coalition has provided our community is already a strong awareness of the digital divide so that when um, COVID hit, you know, there was already this, an, an understanding by a lot of people. And then a lot, then there were others who suddenly realized, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? <laughs> this is really bad when you don't have um, students or teachers um, who, who have access and are trying to do um, distance learning or you have people out of work and, and the normal places where people would go for assistance or help are closed like libraries or other organizations um, with computer labs. So I think, um, you know, going back, I mean, I think it really helped to lay a foundation and, and to get the word out and to already be working in this space and trying to bring as many stakeholders to the table. I think since March, we've had a lot more people come to the table. And so it's really enriched the number of people collaborating and it's expanded our reach. So Kansas City, Missouri is right on the state line um, of Kansas. And so we'd had sporadic involvement, you know, of, of people across the state line, um, as is the case with the coalition, people get busy. But since then, we've had really strong participation from many of the counties um, in our area. But I would say that um, 
the, the collaborations that we've been able to do, the partnerships, because we all know each other and we were all meeting leading up to this point has really helped solidify some incredible projects that we're now able to work on. That's perfect. Thank you, Carrie. So continuing with our theme of how folks are changing, uh, San Antonio uh, has been around for multiple years uh, and now um, there was already a question in the chat, Renee. Uh, <laughs> Laura Vogel saw your mention of becoming a nonprofit, and she's like, what? Wait, tell me about that. Because all the coalitions that are out there, other than what you guys are talking about and what Baltimore is talking about, folks don't hold money, essentially. There's, there isn't, there's no, you don't need, they don't need to put money anywhere. Kansas City has a fund inside the library, right? But it's, it's, not like they're dispersing checks often. So Renee, talk to us about why you would start a nonprofit. Um, well, I mean, essentially the short and sweet of it's the fundraising ability to basically um, do it a little bit more effectively in the sense of <clears throat> having some unified common goals that are shared across number one, our organization itself um, and all the members who are part of the steering committee and our general membership, but also the fact that there is um you know, some some pretty big things happening in San Antonio with our Connecting Beyond the Classroom initiative that I know that folks have spoken to you all about in, in previous webinars um, this during the series. So essentially having all these things happen all at once and the pandemic, it essentially elevated our role slight, a lot more in the community as far as um, level of, uh, of seriousness that the, that the folks are taking here in San Antonio to address the digital divide. And in order to basically um, not really duplicate efforts or be counterintuitive with other fundraising efforts, we felt that it would be helpful to kind of transition to a, a C3 um, because essentially we all operate under volunteer based type situation. We don't have a full time person working at DASA. And during this day and age when we're escalating these solutions literally from one day to the next, um, you know, it, it's very important that communication and, and all that is very, very effective and that what we say in one meeting is the same thing as others are, are speaking about, whether that be within City Hall or within the county. Um, so that consistent unified approach is, is all basically kind of similar to how we want to approach the fundraising as well, too. If we can bring dollars to San Antonio for a purpose that either involves greater access devices or digital literacy and adoption, then we want it to be a win for all those organizations that are doing that. And um, I think it also kind of gives a little bit more confidence to the funders too, that everybody's working collaboratively and that there isn't any competition amongst each other too, because I think that, um, you know, funds are limited and we know this and there's so the, the need is universal, but the funds are not right. So we have to be very um, effective in how we um, communicate that as an alliance and as well as how we seek to raise funds to implement those strategies. Super, Renee, thank you. Chrissy, you all are having similar discussions. So talk to us about money. Yes, yes, yes. So um, as you mentioned, you know, BDEC, Baltimore Digital Equity Coalition, uh, we are, are not an, a legal entity, if you will. Uh, we are, are a movement, but within that, um, funding has been really um, the driving force for us to get the job done. So the coalition for VDEC for us, it was not just to come together to share thoughts and ideas around how to close the digital divide. It was truly to create teams that would be called work groups where the work actually gets done. Um, and when I say the work gets done, I mean um, amongst our teams, um, our initiatives around tech support, around um, mesh network installation, um, device distribution, um, and advocacy, we had to get funding um, to start these initiatives and to get them going and to keep them going. And um, philanthropic dollars, our local funders and foundations, um, really, I mean, they, came, they showed up. They showed up for us um, in March and, and April, and we had to, to you know, create a budget. Um, and I say we, it was, you know, of course, a group effort and um, put a lot of time into that. But our funders came together, truly, 
um, in Baltimore. And uh, one specific and particular funder, um, Jane Brown from the uh, Robert W. Deutsch Foundation has been in digital equity and really advocating um, for digital equity for a very, very long time, long before me, uh, I came into the picture. Um, but this is really an opportunity and the first time that so many organizations which are so siloed um, in our city and have been for, for so long have come together for this greater effort. So our, our funders um, really showed up, as I said, and we you know raised over $400,000 um, initially to launch um, all of these initiatives. Uh, which are are still in full throttle. Um, you know, we we have uh, those initiatives, the tech support hotline that is up and running, and uh, mesh networks being installed, and devices being refurbished and and distributed. So, um, our next step is to hopefully get the city um, to provide funds to us, which is a whole nother um, topic. But um, fingers crossed, we'll be able to to request funding from the city um, specifically for digital equity, um, digital uh, connectivity, you know, access devices and digital skills training. Super, Chrissy, thank you. So a note for, for folks that getting funding from the city is awesome for the cities, the cities who've been able to figure that out. And uh, Miles will put in the chat the link to NDIA's Trailblazers. So for those who are looking at getting your city support, the Trailblazers is the list of which local governments are involved in digital inclusion work. They are the honor roll of local governments. And so those in particular who provide funding, well, for any of the issues, but funding's one of the issues, there's links. So you can see who does provide funding and how did they decide where it goes. So Mia, let's turn to you next. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by Matt that they were in Portland, they were recruiting folks to participate who were serving the population that they had identified um, as being unconnected. Tell us about how you, who you were recruiting to your group and how you did it. Yeah, so, um, you know, I come from a little different space. I'm an elected official and I have different restrictions actually this year because I'm on the ballot. Um, and so uh, the way that this coalition really came together was organically from a carryover of legislation we worked on last year. And it's not really right. It's not um, who it's not what you know, it's who you know. And there was probably a core of 14 of us that were really coming together. Um, and through that, we developed a shared drive, a good old G drive. And from that, we had repetitive meetings and others would go out um, and ask to invite others to come in. And with that, you'll see we have over, I think, 120 different participants who come and go. Um, but because of the shared drive, you know, we record and we take notes and we really do a lot to try to break down those barriers so that folks are meeting one another that maybe would never have been in that shared space before this. Um, and it is actually very fulfilling. Um, and to keep that energy up, I think we're in our 30th week. So uh, it's great to see so many things, so many problems being solved by just folks meeting one another. Awesome. Thank you. Renee, can you tell us about the kinds of organizations that are a member of DIASA, which we should note, because um, Renee mentioned it earlier, DIASA is the name of their coalition, Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio. I'm sorry, everybody else, they have the best name. <laughs> so, um, tell us, Renee, about uh, who, the kinds of organizations that are in your coalition. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're very, we're very fortunate. You know, I was not part of the founders who, when we originally were created, uh, who had a very strong representation from members of the city, uh, city staff, and who ultimately, you know, became members of the Office of Innovation to really carry the torch at the city side. So that was very critical. But um, <clears throat> beyond that, we have folks that are part of uh, Bear County. Um, we have folks that are part of Goodwill, the TAP program, um, Bibliotech, which I'm sure you guys have heard about. Um, we have folks that are um, within uh, Intercultural Development Research Association, um, the Martina Street Women's Center, so pretty diverse group of folks. Um, initially, we had uh, selfishly had Mooney Ray with the, with, she was with housing and now she's actually with the city doing a much bigger, bigger role there too. So um, I feel like we've, uh, we've been pretty diverse in the, in the folks that have been part of the, of the organization and the Alliance so far and really have expanded that um, with our general membership organization as well too. City Education Partners is part of our, um, of our general membership um, and things like that. So essentially we welcome all the area nonprofits and actually 
even um, you know, internet providers. I know we have folks that are part of T-Mobile, Google Fiber that are involved in our coalition as well too. Um, so I, actually, you know, the more the merrier. You know, if, if you're involved and you have an interest in digital inclusion here in San Antonio, um, we want you at the table. Um, if you're a, if you, a youth code jam is another one. I, they're all coming to my mind kind of organically here, but um, just a, a very lively bunch of folks that that are, are very strategically placed in very good places. And um, you know, I, I I think about how our organization has has changed over the years. And you know, I think that um, in some ways, being able to get some of these folks who or organizations uh, who are part of our group to to really run with a lot of these initiatives is actually the key thing here. It's it's the fertile ground for those partnerships amongst those organizations um, that we want to focus on. Super. Thank you, Renee. You all have very different structures to your coalitions. Um, Miles, if you would grab the link to the um, Building Digital Inclusion Coalitions guidebook. We wrote this a few years back. Um, and when we wrote it, all of the coalitions that we talked to were coalitions that were big tent coalitions. Every, just like Renee was saying, everybody come in. Um, so Carrie, talk to us about this, the clear decision that that be the structure and not be the kind of structure where you're doing the work, that the work stays within the organizations and it's not the coalition doing the digital inclusion work. Right. Uh, thanks. Well, I think that it, it, it largely stems from the fact that anybody who's working in a coalition or, or smaller group task force, you realize you all have real other full-time jobs that you're responsible for doing that, that touches um, on digital inclusion in some way, or you're serving um, an organization or clients in some capacity that is. So you don't really have time to take on big, huge projects. And many times someone in the coalition already can or will, but it's it's bringing the group together to, to brainstorm the best way to do it, to get the word out about what's being done and then how to tackle that job together, maybe supporting one organization or one institution. So, you know, here, if there's a, something going on at the library, then we make sure the coalition knows, but that could be any single coalition, you know, member who participates. It could be, you know, connecting for good. If they have a refurbishing event, then that, that is announced throughout the coalition, but maybe all of the client, many of the clients who are at the coalition need to know where, you know, connecting for good, who's now PCs for people, what they need to go, what they need to do. So I think that you realize, um, you know, it's been an age old issue. How, who's who's going to run the coalition? Who's going to be responsible? You know, we need a full time person. But I, I just feel like that's, you know, a never ending question. And so I think the sooner that you can realize we're going to meet, we're going to share ideas, we're going to do the projects that we can, we're going to hold summits, we're going to hold community events, we're going to share as much information as we can. I feel like that's the best way to try to tackle things right now. And because there's just not funding for a full time person. For the first time this year, we did get a Vista who is dedicated from the library specifically to the coalition, which is wonderful. But we all know that that's not sustainable long term. So I think just understanding that and not trying to beat your head over, well, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Just we're going to just do what we can do and go from there. Thank you, Carrie. Chrissy, in Baltimore, you all have made a very different decision, right? So describe to us the, the process to making the decision that you all came up with. Yeah, so, you know, all of, similar to, to, to others, everything within the BDAC and everyone is doing this work um, on a volunteer basis. So, so, you know, we have, of course, our full-time jobs within our organizations, and then we have our second full-time job, which we have not to get paid for, but we get paid in different ways, you know? So, so it, it's rewarding. Um, and the four of us that founded um, the BDEC, so, uh, you know, my, myself, which represents Bike Back, so the digital, me naturally would lead the digital skills team, um, Adam Eckelman, um, who is the um, AD of Libraries Without Borders, um, leads the advocacy team. Um, Kelly Hodge Williams, PCs for People, um, leads the device access team naturally. And uh, Andrew Coy from uh, Digital Harbor Foundation leads the connectivity team. So all of us, although it, it's it, they're, they're separate, but our regular everyday jobs are very, very, very similar to what we're supporting in BDAC and the teams and the work groups that we support. Um, we, it, it's like I said, a full-time job. Um, the four of us um, 
have been really making uh, all of the, the, the core, I guess, development processes of everything and everything that we do, we ensure that we share with the entire coalition. So all members that participate um, to ensure transparency. We knew from the beginning that building trust through transparency is top priority for us. Um, and, you know, what we didn't want to happen is for uh, anybody um, to think that we were doing this for our own purposes or it, to serve our own organizations um, and, and no one else. Um, so with that, you know, for, for me personally, um, it was very big for me that that was clear. And um, so all of the money that we have raised and even for the digital skills team, um, none of that money, not even admin or any percentage of anything um, has gone to bite back. So this is truly just in support of the community. Um, we were able to raise funds um, for a BDEC director. So we are in the process and have been in the process of looking for this unicorn um, <laughs> who, who we hope to hire um, within the next few weeks if everything goes great. Um, but our once again, our local funders came together and said, yes, we will come together and fund this. Um, so we were able to raise um, about two years of their salary. Um, so that has been amazing. So as soon as we get that person on board, they will become, you know, the, the, the head and the lead of the BDEC around strategic citywide planning and an action plan and, and oversee the work groups and myself and the other three co-founders will um, serve, you know, as, as we are still now, the coordinating committee and also serve on the, um, you know, the teams and the advisory board along with some other folks. So, Chrissy, will you form a 501c3 or will there be a fiscal sponsor? So, we have no plans to form a 501c3. Uh, we did, a fiscal sponsor was something that we needed if we were going to raise funds. Um, so, that was a, a interesting conversation in, its, in and of itself. Um, Andrew Coy from Digital Harbor Foundation offered um, to be BDEC's interim fiscal sponsor um, at 0%. So he collected no fees and um, has served as BDEC's fiscal sponsor since um, inception in, back in March and had been the one to disperse you know, um, funds to the organizations who were leading the initiatives. Um, we did our due diligence and we got our funders involved um, around choosing the best fiscal sponsor um, to house BDEC at permanently. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was an, you know, a, a decision within the coalition and that everybody had a say um, and just what made the most sense. So uh, we recently um, signed the dotted line and have a permanent fiscal sponsor, which is uh, Maryland Philanthropy Network. And um, so we are moving forward as a fiscally sponsored project of um, NPN. And um, who knows, down the line, it may make sense to form a 501c3, but that's definitely not, not in the plans right now. Super, thank you. Uh, so there's a question from Stephanie in the chat, which if everyone would please put their questions in the q and I'm less likely to lose track of them. Um, but she asks uh, if the coalitions carry insurance. And I think this comes back to that question, that issue of us needing to clarify that these are loose coalitions. You're not legal entities. There's nobody to sue. Right. Matt, do you want to speak to that issue? Yeah, very much. We are a, an organization of organizations. And so we, um, there is nobody, there is no den legal entity. It's a, um, an organization that uh, is supported from a funding and meeting standpoint by uh, the city of Portland, Multnomah County, and Multnomah County Library. But most of that support comes in terms of, uh, of in-kind. Of We are actually paid as part of our jobs to be members of the DEN. It's a, a, a slice of what I do. Um, and, and, and that's true for, for the others who work on it. Um, the Office of Community Technology at the at uh, the city of Portland, um, in that office, Rebecca Gibbons works full time on issues around equity and digital equity, and so she puts a lot of effort into the den. Um, but 
we don't have a separate legal entity. We did we did broach the idea of would we form a 501c3 uh, a few years ago, but um, there wasn't funding, and, and we didn't know where that funding would come from, and uh, and we were felt like we were effectively meeting what we wanted out of the den um, in terms of we were we were providing that um, uh, caucus for organizations to come together and figure out what are we doing around advocacy? How are we meeting our digital equity action plan goals? And so, um, but, but that was very much because the local government, city, county, county library uh, provided that in-kind funding, they provided meeting space, they provided incidental funding. Um, and then when we had our own digital inclusion summit in 2018, we found local sponsors to fund that. Um, again, a lot of that was in kind. Um, and the people who worked on it were providing in kind funding. Um, and then we got some nice sponsors like Mozilla was our primary sponsor who bought everyone lunch and, and met some of the other incidental expenses. So on the issue of summits, uh, Kansas City, Portland, San Antonio has all held summits. You did get sponsors for those summits to cover your costs. Uh, so if you're not a legal entity, how did you do that? So Carrie? I can answer that, Angela. Um, th uh, to me, it's just another case for why you shouldn't, uh, unless you have a full-time person, to me, if you if you become a 501c3, you really need somebody to manage all the details of that. And then if you're going to have, um, you know, uh, if you're going to have a fund, then who's going to be responsible for doing the fundraising for the fund? And then who is responsible for dispersing that money equitably amongst the members of the coalition? I mean, you're just talking about more work on top of more work for people that are already engaged in the space. So. Um, in Kansas City, when, when we started um, Google Fiber, they actually started a, um, a digital inclusion fund through our community foundation. And then what we had initially hoped was that we would get um, corporations and others to sponsor, and then we would find a way to, you know, at the time, um, the coalition wasn't responsible for dispersing that money, others were. But that kind of um, dried up because there was no one to maintain the continued fundraising that you would need. So then that's when the library became a fiscally responsible agent so that we could then do summits and collect sponsorships in order to, so, so we do have, the library has a, co a specially marked Kansas City <laughs> Coalition fund inside the library that can only be used um, for coalition related things and it has to be approved of by the steering council of, of the coalition. But again, that's all unofficial. We're not in any official capacity, but we, again, try to use transparency and, and are equitable about what decisions we make. So I wonder then if it's this moment in time, like we all know that the digital inclusion uh, awareness, right, the joke that we're all our popularity, all of us, <laughs> all of us doing digital inclusion work, our popularity is through the roof, <laughs> but none of us have changed the things we're doing. We're just doing more of it. Like, you know, like Chrissy, she now has an extra job that she doesn't get paid for. <laughs> so um, is that, do we think, like Chrissy, do you think you could have fundraised for starting a 501c3 and paying for a staff person if you didn't have the awareness that we are getting right now during this pandemic? Oh gosh, no. Definitely not. You know, um, that's one thing, I, you know, sometimes it happens. It's, you know, what is the hot topic? What is the sexy topic right now that everybody's talking about? And right now that's di the digital divide and COVID gave that spotlight or shine that spotlight on the digital divide, which I am grateful for. Um, and, you know, my, I guess, hope is that when, you know, COVID, dies off that this excitement um, and, and motivation to close the digital divide from funders specifically, as well as from organizations that um, the, that, that motivation won't die, you know, with COVID, if you will. Um, so it's, I, I want to make sure I get to your question. <laughs> I want to make sure I get to it. So it's, um, you know, like I said, funders have been supportive, but Baltimore is a very special community um, in so many ways. And the, the, 
the the local funder community is 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 tight knit. So everybody talks to everybody, um, and it's a great network of of people who truly care about the city. Um, so that's an important piece. But um, I, I don't think it would have gotten the attention that it needed because there has been work in this space for, like I said, many years before I came into the digital equity space in Baltimore, um, and has been an issue for decades. Um, you know, just from uh, all the way back to, you know, just redlining. I mean, it's it, in the issues at hand and the, the um, systemic racism, if you will, um, and, and the core and the history of, of why the digital divide is. Um, so, you know, I, I would hope that, um, you know, if we weren't in this situation with COVID that we could have gotten to this point with the coalition and with the efforts that have, have been successful and, and just getting off the ground as well. Um, but, you know, I, I'm grateful that this opportunity, because it's a silver lining, you know, it's, it's hard to find a silver lining with a pandemic, but um, the silver lining is that opportunity to, um, to utilize this, this spotlight um, to really make some change. That was perfect, thank you, Chrissy. So we're getting questions about challenges. Um, so rather than just ask you all broadly about challenges, let's get specifically into to certain challenges that we all know that we all struggle with. Um, Cause a lot of your challenges are NDIA's challenges too, cause we do the same thing you do just at a national level. Uh, so internet service providers, are they in the coalition? Or are they not in the coalition, right? Because, and NDIA struggles with this also, we need them but do we always want to hear from them? Mia, can you speak to the discussions that your group has had about who's in the group and who's not in the group? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's, that's a difficult one, right? Um, I, uh, so the, our large providers are definitely monitoring and have asked to be part of the coalition. Um, that doesn't mean they're participating. Uh, they're watching and waiting to see what, right? We're, we're a, very transactional society. So they're looking for some transactions, whether it's legislation being proposed, um, it, but um, they're, they're not a monolith either, right? So there are smaller telecom companies and there, there's an opportunity there in that space. Um, and so I think much like in all of our spaces, people uh, represent more than just one thing. So whether it's a lobbyist who has multiple clients or special interest groups who are trying to think about their own priorities, but recognizing that at some point in time, they, they can't succeed unless uh, these large providers are part of the solution. So yeah, um, that is the, the very difficult part of this is what type of legislation will provide sustainable approaches, uh, not just charitable giving. Um, just short of being utility, what do we do when there's a moratorium or not a moratorium for other things? So so those that's our moment in time right now. Um, and I just can't help but think of the story around, you know, we're all pulling babies out of the river. At some point in time, we all have to go up the river and figure out who's throwing the babies in the river. And I think that that's where we're at right now is we're at that spot of how many people can we bring with us to go up the river, understand what that means and really put pressure on ourselves and others to do, you know, to do the right thing. So I'm gonna get at two issues here. We need to get at advocacy, which Mia just brought up and we need to have, get into that more intensely. Um, but I also wanna stay on this thought of who's in the coalition. So Matt, your group has gone through some deep reflections about who's in your coalition, and this is a challenge you all are decided to tackle. Tell us about those discussions. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so we, uh, as we were ending the, the uh, time plan for our, our digital equity action plan, um, we were looking at taking a fresh look at the DIN and uh, uh, one of the things we were asking ourselves is who's at the table? And we have, uh, there's a lot of impetus in Portland, um, not just on the streets, which we take too frequently, but also uh, in government, in entities to, um, to address systemic racism. And when we looked at our digital inclusion network, honestly, we looked and we saw a very white, 
a very, um, a group that was people like myself who could attend meetings in downtown Portland once a month, who had the support of, of Multnomah County. Um, and over time, although for things, at, including your, you might remember your visit when we were planning that inclusion, Angela, of course you were a big draw and we would get more more organizations would come and we would have a terrific turnout. But very often the voices at the table, as opposed to those looking at a recording or listening to a conference call, the voices at the table were a lot of the same organizations. Um, and we were not hearing the voices from a lot of the community, particularly the BIPOC community that we most wanted to serve. And so we held a reflections event that was scheduled for March. It was just at the beginning of COVID. We all sort of tried to practice social distancing. Um, but uh, we had some roundtable workshops um, that were facilitated by a local consultancy, a, a black owned consultancy that's very much about helping organizations move forward in becoming anti-racist organizations. And not as an exercise, not as a box that's ticked. Okay, we did our we did our equity training, we did our our, our you know anti-racist you know workshops. But really, how do we remake our organization in a way that adds voices to the table who have not been there or have not been there since the beginning, or or that we hear from very infrequently? So that's been a big. I don't have the answer. We've we've made a lot of progress. We have. Um, uh, out of that, we have uh, worked with the consultancy to uh, to develop, you know, pro procedures to to uh, for training for outreach, and we're in the middle of those. COVID did knock a lot of those back and changed our timeline, but that's those are the kind of questions we're asking ourselves. Um, that's fabulous, we, and we appreciate you sharing where you all are, and that it is a process, and that it is a challenge, right? Going to the other issue Mia brought up of advocacy. Um, when we, when NDIA was writing that uh, Building Digital Inclusion Coalition's guidebook, which Miles put in the chat, um, we we asked the, so we, we NDIA does everything by learning from you all, right? Learning from the folks on the ground, that's how we learn things. Um, and so we we're asking lots of questions. And one of the questions we asked was, so who's doing advocacy work? Nothing, nobody. Like, really? Nobody's doing anything? And then we keep talking and keep talking. And somebody says, well, our executive director went and talked to city council. And then, uh, somebody else is like, oh, and we did the made sure that the story got into the newspaper. I was like, y'all are doing advocacy. Uh, but folks weren't calling it advocacy. We in the nonprofit world have this, um, this aversion to lobbying because we've been told you're going to lose your 501c3 status if you lobby, right? Turns out you can actually do a small amount of lobbying, but we're all, we've all been, fear has been thrown into us so greatly that we don't do it. Well, I can tell you, NDIA does it. We know what our limit is and we stay way under it. Um, but also just the idea of awareness, awareness building, that's advocacy. So let's talk a bit about that that kind of advocacy. Renee, I think in San Antonio, it is um, my theory. I could be totally wrong, but I don't think it. That, uh, <laughs> that because you all had the coalition around for years and you had such great participation in the coalition, when the pandemic hit, and there was discussion of the city building a network to address the lack of affordable access for students that everybody was like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and well, I it, attribute that yeah. to the coalition because you had already, you've already done a lot of the awareness building. Thoughts? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, number one, it's having the relationships, right? These are people that they're not just folks that we, you know, send an email to her once in a while. I mean, these are, these are partners, right? I, you know, we, we consider our, our folks that are um, within the office of innovation, right. Who basically helped us get this project <clears throat> along with, along with members in our organization and, and getting it to that level of, of, of seriousness really in such a short order of time. Um, you know, it involved some tough conversations. It, it involved some, you can't do this. Yes, we can. And kind of battling back and forth until we're whittling it down to something that can be done. 
and it's something that isn't going to get us in trouble <laughs> and things like that and something that is feasible um, and, and simplify the solution basically. And in order to really do that, you got to have those personal relationships and, you know, you got to quit thinking of them as there's somebody inside city hall and there's somebody inside the county commissioner's offices. They are advocates just like you. They're, they're wanting the same outcome just like you. And you got to go through and have those tough conversations together. And I think that um, I, I don't think that we would be um, where we're at right now, where we're working um, to get some pilots into the into, off the ground to inform the larger project that we may be doing, um, that the city will be doing later this, uh, well, next year. Um, if we had, if we did not have those relationships, if we didn't have um, people that founded DIASA who end up now working in the agencies that are actually undertaking this. I mean, we couldn't have asked, I don't think, for a better scenario um, because we don't need to go beat down doors now. Like we actually have advocates from inside the city as well, too. Um, so it just takes the um, it just takes having those relationships. I can't emphasize that enough because these are folks that that we're not afraid to call. You pick up the phone, and if we were not in pandemic times, we would be face to face exploring these tough conversations together um, because we're all on the same team here, and that's the number one takeaway from that. We're all on the same team. Well, and I, Angela, I'm sorry, Carrie, go ahead. I was just going to add to that, that I mean, and even if you know, all of us that we're calling ourselves uh, information sharing and awareness have become advocates, I think, in this time, because now suddenly many counties and cities or community funds or people have banded together and say, we want to help people, you know, because of what's happening, this pandemic. So who needs help? And suddenly we want to make sure that we have a seat at the table, that all of these people, you know, students and families and teachers and people who are out of work and college students, there's so many people that are truly in the digital divide now that um, the pandemic has hit. So I think it's really forced a lot of us to just become advocates. If you're going to get money from the county, you have to go testify. And in our county, they don't let you do it by Zoom. You have to show up in person and you have to wait and, you know, address the legislature. Legislatures. And you have to, you know, many cases I've, I've had to go and talk about and, and members of the steering council as well, or have had to go and advocate for for why this is so important. And, and this has always been a problem. And we've had this coalition for many years at this group meeting, but, you know, you didn't realize it. And so now, it, you know, <laughs> you really need to be involved. So I think part of what's what that's helped us do is really crystallize a lot of the projects that we're working on right now. So one of the things that we've done is um, we've we've created um, through our university a Missouri State broadband resource rail, which is led by the university and their students, and they're collecting all of the information in the entire state. You know, where can you get a device? Where can you take a class? All of those things. Um, we've started, um, the library is now leading, we received funding to do a regional call center. And when I say regional, you know, our library is gonna do a regional call center for digital inclusion work. That's That happened because of the pandemic and money that was available. We're right in the process. Um, Aaron Deacon of KC Digital Drive is helping to start a metro-wide internet assistance fund that is through our utility company. So for the first time, this is something we've all talked about. How can we get people funding a subsidy to help them either get connected for the first time and pay six months of payments or get them reconnected if they've been you know, bumped out of the system somehow. So I think there's just so many things that you, if, now is the time to jump in and be an advocate whether you want to or not. And so I think you know, for those of us that, that didn't wanna be an advocacy group, it's, that's the way you're gonna be able to get the funding and, and create you know, all these relationships you know, that um, that we were just talking about and how to, how to, how to coalesce and finally, you know, take action. The, the subsidy for broadband issue that Carrie's referring to, Rick Usher from the city of Kansas City has shared that on NDI, one of NDIA's Friday calls. Yeah. So as that project progresses, we'll make sure to have Rick back again to tell us some more because everybody wants to know more. Is I think it might be the first city level work uh, well, I and don't it's, know any Angela, it's really regional. It's it's Johnson County, Kansas. It's Kansas City, Missouri. We're working, you know, all of us are working together to come up with a plan to be able to do that. And, and we're literally days away from starting it. That's awesome. So there's a really good question from Krister in the Q&A about um, city, county, regional, state. So um, Four of you are based uh, locally, metro kind of areas, and then, as Carrie was noting, expands out 
as needed. Um, Mia is running a statewide group. Uh, so Mia, talk to us a bit about um, the, what you're hearing and the differences between how your group operates at the state level versus what you've been hearing from these folks at their more local levels. Yeah, um, well, first of all, in the chat, you see the petition that was drafted and it's under the headline of the Equity Education Coalition. And that's really a spinoff, right, of these partners that come together and really put forward um, a pilot project to help fund digital navigators. So again, when you have a coalition this large, you have those that want to solve problems right now on the ground today. And then you have your medium and long-term um, folks who are, who are working. So you have your school associations, whether it's your teachers or your school directors, and they're coming forward with legislative priorities, um, the cities and the counties. And so those become statewide right, initiatives, but there is this moment of time that really those um, lobbyists or those advocates needed to learn the definitions, right, and the understanding of the three-legged stool and how that correlates to their membership. And so that's what you're seeing now happening, our decision packages and policy, hopefully policies that will match not just budget requests, but actual policy. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that sort of answers the question and how some organizations are very much statewide and some are just for their particular membership or very local. But together, collectively, if you're really thinking about equity, you're focusing on the disparities. And I think the role of more of the IAC group, which is the Internet Access Crisis Team, that's really the statewide space, right? That's where everybody can come together and have shared learning, listening to what San Antonio is doing, right? And then try to, you know, to convert that in a way that's either local or statewide. That's perfect. Thank you. So we also have questions in the chat that are getting at more of the practitioner impact. Um, and for the most part, I was trying to stay away from that, but I feel like you all have so much to share because I was trying to get into the whole coalition business. So quick side note, there's a bunch of additional information in the other webinars for folks who haven't watched them. But, but let's get into it a little bit. Um, there, there's a question in here about the the devices um, into the hands who need them and increasing the broadband access. Renee, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure, and and I, and I think that we're we're on the precipice of of developing our digital equity plan to kind of answer and guide us. To be honest with you, so while I would love to have an answer for you, I think that it highlights that we're in the process of developing that strategic plan and co-developing that with the city of San Antonio and Bear County and the other partners who are wanting to tackle this together. Um, we want that common goal. We don't need to have 15 goals related to devices. We have one big one that all of us are leaning in on together. And um, as far as where the need exists, we're very thankful that previous to the pandemic, um, in December 2nd last year, we launched our digital divide assessment um, in conjunction with our, with our local partners. And we had that open right up until February, um, shortly before the pandemic even broke out. And that gave us a city uh, council district and uh, county precinct uh, level of evaluation to be able to determine which of these areas within the city um, need it the most. So, you know, stay tuned. We're putting our plan together. And as we put that together, that's where we're hoping to develop those common unifying goals and strategies and identify who are going to be those partner organizations who are going to be contributing efforts and, and um, resources to basically accomplish that. So stay tuned. Great. Thank you, Renee. Chrissy, do you want to answer the same question? Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, our device, we have a device access team, as I mentioned, you know, we break our coalition down into four, four teams. Um, and one of those teams um, is the device access team. So that is um, truly focused on um, getting computers, um, mostly use computers. Um, and and refurbishing them and then dispersing them out to the community um, in most cases through community organizations, uh, whether it be um, you know adults or K through 12 um, or, or, or youth, older youth. Um, so we really, this whole effort um, really depends greatly on the local community. Um, so the big businesses and corporations in Baltimore um, to when they're recycling their devices, you know, to send them to um, the VDAC or through PCs for People uh, so that we can really, I mean, the supply, 
it, it's low. The demand is high. The supply is low. Um, so, you know, we really, really depend on these local businesses and, and, and the big corporations specifically, but also individuals um, who just have computers laying around in their homes that they haven't been using um, to donate. So it's truly an effort to come together and to get these donated devices um, and refurbish them um, through our, our main refurbishers PCs for people. But we do have smaller refurbishers, you know, and organizations um, like Code in the Schools, for instance, um, that Baltimore Robotics that actually take their time to refurbish them themselves. Um, so for us, getting the refurbished devices is the, is the most economical way to do it as well. I mean, a refurbished device would cost anywhere between 75 to 150 bucks, uh, which is, you know, a, a big difference when we're talking about purchase of a brand new computer. Um, and even the, the supply of brand new computers was affected by COVID. So um, it was really hit in so many directions uh, with, you know, the, the issues around trade and import and export that came about during this time affected the supply and demand. So um, it's an ongoing effort, but we, we are leaning on the community for this. So it, it occurs to me that because we have new folks learning about digital inclusion, um, that it's probably important for us to explain that in Baltimore in particular, you all are so fortunate to have four organizations that were already addressing digital equity issues. Can we all just kind of like <laughs> be astounded by that? <laughs> to begin with? Um, so they were, so like buyback PCs, they were all doing the work already. It's not as if the coalition is what caused them to do the work, but there's that increased coordination and fundraising and things like we need devices donated, right? Like, so you're able to spread the messages. So I think for those who are new into this field, that's important for us to explain. They may have none of those four. They may have nobody refurbishing. They may have uh, nobody other than the library that they know of um, that is focused entirely on teaching digital literacy, right? Most organizations wrap it into other services. So you may not know that it's happening. Um, they may have nobody working on building networks, right? Like anybody want to address this challenge of who, what if you're starting from scratch? I guess I can speak very quickly about all these small action teams or all these small coalitions of coming together. I think an example was just yesterday, we were trying to figure out call center build out. That call center build out, right, should be rooted in the community with community-based organizations, with trusted adults, with soft handoffs, um, right, on and on. And so 211 in itself is statewide and it's there, but it's just very much at the top and not necessarily understanding digital equity inclusion and the needs, right, all the way from AARP or senior adults to our, you know, our, um, our communities of color. Um, but then like equity and, educa equity and education coalition is doing it in partnership with Facebook and UPRO and building a workforce development training module. And so there is this idea here in this space of trying to build a better version of ourselves. Um, and that's just one example, I think, of how these small one-off action teams or these coalitions are built, being built in a very, you know, street ball way versus the NBA way, right? Like just very grassroots. Yeah, that's awesome in a very street ball kind of way. Um, uh, Angela, I think I think we yeah. need a national network where we can all connect all the resources that we all have and then everybody can tap into them no matter where they are. Maybe somebody should create something like that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, I would just say I would just say point people as well to um, to after. If yes. there's a lack of refurbishment that you might be surprised what's happening in your community and uh, and if not, they would certainly support the creation of a local refurbisher. So um, the Alliance for Technology Refurbish and Reuse, I believe it is. Yeah. Yes, and one of and Miles will put that in our uh, yeah. in our chat. Um, and, and I'd also just say go to your local library. They're they're almost certainly the largest provider of digital equity in your community already, and so they yes. are a great place to start. Super. Thank you, Matt. 
Okay, team, we're wrapping it up. Um, last piece of advice that you would give to those who are thinking about starting a coalition. Renee, you wanna go first? Well, you know, I, I, I mentioned that when I was responding to one of the questions in the Q&A is, you know, I wasn't around when we got founded um, back in 2017 with the Digital Inclusion Alliance, but I, I, you mentioned it right off, you took the words from my mouth, Matt. I said, start with your library. Um, you know, these are people, places where computers are at, internet connectivity is at, all the information is there. And if you can ask maybe a library director or somebody, you know, what are some of the programs that we're doing in the community already to help provide this access, provide um, some training on how to use this technology, I think is a great place to start. Um, also, maybe, you know, explore the bureaucracy within the county government and city government and just see, is there anybody that I can talk to um, who would be, you know, help me understand that I'm not duplicating something and that I'm working with the people that I need to be working with. So a lot of conversations, a lot of um, exploring, um, you might get some dead ends, but you might find some surprises and you might find out that you've got like in Baltimore, four rock star organizations in your backyard to then use that to stand on. Same thing in Kansas city and all over the country where we, we have these, we're so blessed to have all these organizations that exist that can cater to all these different legs of the stool. And um, I'm actually selfishly mentioning, I'm gonna plug Brownsville here because the least connected city in America, you know, Lit Communities is working with them to not be the least connected city in, anymore. And part of our effort there is to build this digital inclusion ecosystem. So we're working with the Federal Reserve Bank and, um, you know, we'll be hitting you all up here very soon because we want to bring national organizations to Brownsville to have them assist and, and cater to these needs in the community. 67% um, of people lacking this internet connectivity, um, perfect environment for, for these nonprofit organizations. So if we don't have them there, we wanna get them there. So stay tuned for that as well. <laughs> awesome, great work, Renee. Can I piggyback on, on Renee's mm -hmm. um, response? Um, I, definitely, I mean, this is the time to, to reach out to the organizations. They don't have to be at digital equity organizations. Your local, Workforce development organizations, adult basic education organizations um, are, are really, really, really key. Um, and that makes up a lot of the BDEC um, and the members of the coalition. And it's not just organizations in the digital equity space. Um, so even if you don't have any specific uh, digital equity organizations, Gather, gather your, your local um, organizations that support the residents in um, workforce development training or, um, you know, in uh, goodness gracious, it could be, it could be anything. It could be um, food deserts. It could be um, healthcare. You know, your local organizations, if you all come together, you will likely find that there is commonalities between the people that you serve um, in your community around digital access, um, digital skills. And once you get the conversations going, then you all will find, oh, we have these common problems and then you can start working on the solutions to them. So that's what I would suggest. Great, thank you, Chrissy. Matt, advice? Sure, I, I'll just echo what Chrissy and Renee said. I think it's something- No we, more echoing. You okay. gotta come up with some new ideas. Right, I'll echo myself, I'll echo myself. <laughs> Again, when we started just that, we didn't ask, we asked the people who were working on digital equity and inclusion, but we asked people who were serving the people who were digitally excluded. And a lot of them were doing things to support digital equity without even really knowing what digital inclusion back then was. So yes, cast that wide net, get those organizations that are serving the people who are excluded. Um, <clears throat> and then my only other thing that I've touched on before, and I'll, I'll say again, is that uh, keep looking at who's at the table to go back to the title of this. That's something that we're doing. I think it's very easy because your local government, your local library will have a consistency and they can be the bedrock of your, your digital inclusion. But a lot of CBOs and others might be struggling, might not be able to attend your meetings. It's very easy for them to, uh, to not be maintained as somebody you're listening to. So keep that outreach going um, and uh, keep, keep asking those questions. Yeah. Perfect, thank you, Matt. Carrie, advice. My advice would be that if you don't have one, you should definitely start one and you don't have to be overwhelmed by the big idea of a coalition. It could just be a group of people getting together and you call yourself a task force or 
you know, a, a crisis group getting together to help solve this problem. Um, and I, I think it's really important that you do something in your community if you can, because, you know, as we said, we started, many of us started out this work and, and you talked to people and they didn't realize that there were people who were in the digital divide. And so while we have less of that now in the pandemic, it's such a complicated issue that I think there's people even in, you know, city and state government who still don't understand the complexities of what the problem is. Is there internet access? Well, they have internet access in that neighborhood. What's the problem? Well, can they afford it? Is it good? Do they cap it at a discounted price? I mean, where are the classes? Are the classes up to speed? You know, it's just, there's so many things that you have to think about and there's so many ways that it's not equitable. And so you really have to look at it through an equitable lens and all of these neighborhoods for all the access that they have. And I still think no matter what room you walk into, there's people, including myself, who don't know all the answers and who don't know all the complexities of this work. And the only way that people are going to know is if we keep talking about it and keep sharing solutions and sharing ideas. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Mia, last word. Yeah, for me, it's really about as an individual, individual, identify who your community is. You know, you really have to come to a solid ground of what that is. The other is be willing to have some uncomfortable silence. This is um, a right. This is a real life changing moment for many people, um, and the natural uh, reaction will be towards incremental change and defy that. Do everything you possibly can to defy incremental change. Um, and, and the last to me is um, recognize that the data that you're looking at is racist and just try to, you know, challenge every part of the way that you can on how the data is being collected, who's being talked about in what way, why are they talking about that way, who's being hurt by you looking at the data and assuming that that's all there is. And uh, I think we just need, really need to challenge ourselves on that. And to me, that will help drive then good policy, the way we talk about things and the energy that it will bring will bring people together for more collective impact. That is a perfect ending to the webinar. Big thank you to our rock star panelists. Uh, we so appreciate the valuable time you have um, shared with us today. Everybody have a great day. Thanks.